Hey, good morning, everybody. If you have your Bibles, you can open them to Psalm chapter 8. And I have a question I want you to consider as we are um, getting ready or as we're jumping into the sermon. And it's this. Here's the question. Where did you witness beauty? Did you see anything beautiful this week? Um, Maybe it was uh, something you heard. I want to read a little selection from a book by N.T. Wright. He says, maybe it's something you heard, maybe some beautiful music, perhaps in church or in the cathedral, maybe something in the world of nature, the sun breaking through the mist and making the autumn leaves luminous. That doesn't really count for our context. That's, that's later. Uh, this summer, this uh, week is going to make you long for autumn, I think. The curl of a squirrel's tail as he sat nibbling a nut. Maybe it was something you smelled, the scent of a rose, perhaps, or the smell of a good meal cooking when you were very hungry. It might be something you taste, a meal well-seasoned and well-cooked. Maybe something you experienced in work, things suddenly coming together, an unexpected new opportunity. It might be something you experienced in human relationships, a quiet, gentle glance from someone you love dearly or the soft squeeze of a child's hand. I want to suggest to you that our ordinary experiences of beauty are given to us to provide a clue, a starting point, a signpost from which we move on to recognize, to glimpse, to be overwhelmed by, to adore, and so to worship not just the majesty, but the beauty of God himself. My, my reason for bringing this up is just to, to get you to consider what have you experienced this week that's beautiful, because I, think, I believe that if you trace that back, you will find that it points to God, the creator of beauty. And this is the time of year, of course, where we get to enjoy our beautiful outdoors here in the Northwest. And uh, I think some people are enjoying the beauty of our outdoors in the Northwest uh, this morning by, by a couple of empty seats here in the, in the room, for example. But listen, we, we are surrounded by beauty in the creation. I got to see Pee Wee Falls up by Boundary Dam past Medellin Falls um, this week, and it's this you know, a little waterfall that the name does not do it justice, by the way. Pee Wee Falls, what kind of name is that? It makes it, it implies that it's tiny or something, but it's, you, you paddle to this location around this, you know, it's the Ponderé River that's dammed right there at the border between Canada and the United States. And then after you paddle around for a little bit, you get to this inlet on the side of the river and there's a majestic waterfall, something like 70 feet tall or maybe even as much as 100 feet tall, beautiful cliffs surrounding it, the trees on the top of the cliffs, and it is beautiful, and it's the kind of beauty that stirs your heart. Maybe you saw a beautiful sunset this week. Maybe you saw, you just had a beautiful experience. Maybe you celebrated the beauty of our freedom on the 4th of July with some fireworks, you know, and the way they make you, make your heart stir, you're just like, wow, right? You can't help but exclaim, about how powerful and something like that is when an explosion's going off above your head, right? I, my, my point is that if we trace back the way beauty stirs us, right, and the beauty of a firework is crafted by people, you know, and, and, and the ingenuity to be able to design something like that that stirs us up, even that is a form of beauty. But the, if we could trace it back, I don't know if you ever, like, had a plumbing problem or an electrical problem, and you found yourself tracing the wires or the pipes, depending on what we're talking about. And you, you go back and you go, okay, oh, okay, here's the, here's, I'm tracing it back this way and I found this is where it goes into the panel or this is where it goes into the hot water heater or whatever it might be. I, I believe that if you trace your experience of beauty in all of its forms and you trace it far enough, you find that it points you back to God, the inventor and creator of all things beautiful. And the Psalms point our attention constantly back to God, specifically in his creation. And there are a number of Psalms that are the nature Psalms that speak about the beauty of his creation. And the, the power, the wonder, the majesty, the glory of God around us that we can just take in with our eyes. We can look and we go, wow, we can learn by observing God's creation. And Psalm 8 will do that. It'll point our attention in a few moments towards the beauty of his creation. But we're in this series right now, the summer in the Psalms. And the point of this series is we're going through um, the Psalms, obviously, that's an easy one. But 
We're looking at what do the Psalms tell us about Jesus? What do they help us understand? And we want to try to understand the book of Psalms as a whole. And we haven't done a lot of teaching out of the Psalms. This is um, over my 15-year tenure as the lead pastor here. I've only done one sermon series through the Psalms, and it was really short. It was like six weeks, just a selection of Psalms. But the Psalms are a real gift to us with our prayer and our worship. Martin Luther called the Psalms the Bible in miniature, that you can sort of trace the whole story of Scripture through the Psalms. It's uh, full of poetry, right, which has a unique place in the human experience of being able to communicate truths in a deep and vivid and beautiful way for us. And it's poetry largely of praise or thanksgiving, praising God for different things that he's done either as a whole for his people or for us personally. And ultimately, we believe as followers of Christ that the Psalms point us towards Jesus. There are prophetic Psalms. Jesus quotes the Psalms. The other New Testament writers will point back to the Psalms and show how Jesus fulfilled different aspects of it. And so we want to remember that too as we dive into the Psalms. So Psalm chapter 8, we're going to read verses 1 through 9. To the choir master, according to the Gittith, a Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the fields, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So I read the psalm, and I started with the note at the top, which, by the way, that's part of our Bibles. You know, sometimes our Bibles will include these headings and subtitles and different things. And my, my Bible says at the top, how majestic is your name, which is not in the original like, text of the Scripture. But what is in the original text is this note to the choir master, according to the Gittith, a psalm of David. So it's written by David. So we, we know that. The Gittith is a mystery, this is one of those things that there, there's a lot, people are divided on what this is. It's either a, a, a key, you know, a, a, how you should sing the song. It could be an instrument, maybe a form of a harp or something, or it could be a tune. But the one thing that we're pretty sure is true about the Gittith, by the way, is that it's connected with the city of Gath. And if you know the, the city of Gath from the story of scripture, this is where Goliath was from, right? Goliath of Gath. This is a Philistine city, a stronghold. So it's connected in some way to that, and we're not exactly sure why it's one of those mysteries that we have. But we see several amazing insights from this scripture. We were talking about the beauty of God and that being communicated through his creation. And and that's the first thing I want to point your attention to this morning is that God communicates through his creation. God communicates through his creation. My uh, family and I were at the... Last summer, a little bit, a little less than a year ago, we were at the um, Smithsonian, the collection of museums in Washington, D.C. And we went to the Air and Space Museum, and they talked a lot about the night sky. And one of the things that gets discussed is the light pollution that we have. Um, Thankfully, we have the, uh, the, the technology and the electricity to be able to light our streets and make us feel safe and things like that. But one of the downsides is that our night sky looks very different than the night sky you know, 100 years ago, or going back to David's time, um, all, all the way back there, his night skies almost look completely different than what our night sky looks like because of the light pollution from the cities and things like that. But that David, we know from his story, would spend a lot of time outdoors, either taking care of sheep or even being on the run. You know, his time he spent as a warrior and all these different military campaigns or when he was on the run from King Saul, that he spent a lot of time under the night sky. And he had a great appreciation of the beauty and majesty of God's creation. And here he mentions, man, he says, God, you are majestic. Your name is majestic in all of the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. 
So he speaks in this wonderfully poetic and beautiful way about the majesty of God, the power of God on display in the skies specifically. And, and he would have seen, you know, like just on a normal night, the, the kind of, you'd have to go like two hours outside of town to some mountain, isolated, secluded place to see what he would see on just a, basically a given, any, any old night. And the Bible invites us over and over again to consider God's creation and to learn what we can from observing his creation. The, the, God communicates through his creation. And we see several basic things. We see several basic things about God. One is that there is a creator, right? Which is a debate that people have outside of churches, right? That all of this couldn't just happen. This was crafted. This was created. We have a God that created the heavens and the earth. That there just is a creator is kind of one of those fundamental things that we observe from creation. And then if you accept that fundamental point, then you, then you realize, what, what can we learn about this creator? Well, he's powerful. Right? Genesis 1 tells the story of creation that, that God spoke these things into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. So that's immense power. That God is big is another thing that we can learn from observing his creation. That he is orderly, right? That he puts things together in systems and where they work together and it's this complex web of ecosystems and, and the environment and all these different things that work together that God is the designer of, that his, the, he's the creator of each of these things. Also that God is creative. You know, the, the, the God that, that spoke into existence, the heavens, is the same God that created little creatures that we find cute or that act funny, you know? That God is very creative. And it says in verse three, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, right? That there's like intricate work that God has done in his creation. We see specifically in what David wants us to see is the glory and the majesty of God, which is a theme throughout all of scripture, that God is glorious, that God is majestic, that God has all the glory, that he really, he created the world for his glory. And there's something very uh, powerful about humans recognizing their place in that, that we exist to give glory back to God, not to give him more than he has, but to reflect his glory back to him, to glorify him, to praise him. That's part of our created duty and our role in, as a part of creation. So God has communicated through his creation, this is what's, what some would call God's first book. And then we were told more specifically about God's plans um, when we look away from, uh, from nature down to his word to tell us more specific things about humanity and about who we are. There's a common problem that people experience. When you begin to understand the scale and the scope of the universe and and the, the, our galaxy and the, the maybe as many as 100 billion other galaxies or more, we don't know the exact number, people begin to feel very small. And for some people, it's like an existential crisis, right? They begin to go like, I don't, if everything is so big and I'm just a speck on a little dot on a small rock hurtling through space in the universe, like, what, what, who am I? Do I matter? Am I alone in the universe? in this massive expanse of what's out there. I found some people online discussing this problem, even an um, astronomer who was talking about, how, she was asked the question, does the scale of the universe ever make you feel depressed? And her answer to the question was like, yeah, kinda. It kinda does. Like I, but, but I sometimes will tell myself a story about who I am in the universe, and it's that the molecules that make up my body used to be part of stars billions of years ago. And then I'm alive in this moment and all of these things came together and, and I get to live this life, but I'm kind of connected to other people through these star molecules that make up all of us. But she's like, yeah, sometimes I do feel pretty hopeless when I think about how short life is and that it, just here for this brief moment in terms of the scale of the universe and how old the earth is and all of these things. And, but if I tell myself that story, then I do stay in this place. So this is a thing that people experience. Like, what, what is my role in all of this if the universe is as, as big as 
we are learning that it is. And I want to share just some statistics, some measurements, some ways of thinking about what the universe is. If you don't feel like that already, maybe you'll feel a little bit more like that after I describe this. No, I'm not trying to make you feel horrible this morning. But I, I want to show you how the scripture tells us how much we matter to the God who created all of this. So the Milky Way, if, you, if scientists were able to build a, um, an atlas, right, a, a book with a page for everything in the Milky Way, and there was a single page devoted to each star, right? So our sun would be on a page with all of its planets and everything like that. And then we'd flip pages to the next star and the next star and the next star. The ones that we can see, the ones that we can observe with the telescope, that what we know about just our Milky Way, right, which is our galaxy, when we look out and we see the night sky, what we see. If there was an atlas of each star in our galaxy so that the sun and its planets took up just one page, so merely to flip through that atlas at a rate of one page per second without taking even a break at all, do you know how long it would take you? 10,000 years. That's our galaxy, right? So then if you think about the universe, right, which we think maybe there could be 100 billion plus galaxies and we are one of them. So the, imagine that each star in the known universe is represented by a single grain of sand. So a thimble would hold all the stars visible on a clear, dark summer night. You could fit them all in a thimble. And a large wheelbarrow would contain the Milky Way, right? The galaxy in which we reside, in which our sun is a part of. But if you were going to display all the stars in the universe, like our estimates, our best estimates of the number of stars in the universe, you would need a freight train with hopper cars filled with sand. And as the train begins to speed by us at a level crossing, we count the cars while we wait, and the cars go past one per second. We would have to keep counting 24 hours a day for three years before all the stars in the universe represented by these grains of sand would have completed its pass in front of us. The scale and the scope of what God has created is hard to wrap our minds around. And it makes people feel insignificant sometimes. It makes them feel small. And David asks this question in verse three and four. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man? that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for. This is the question we all should be asking when we look at the beauty of God's creation and the scale and the scope of it. What is man? This is the question that people, many people are asking around the world when they begin, begin to understand these things we've been talking about. I feel insignificant. I feel very small. And David speaks these words that are so encouraging and so full of hope which is that we matter to God. God what, is this, what is man that you are mindful of him, right? That you even think about him and the son of man that you care for him? How could the God that spoke the universe into existence and placed the stars in the sky and the moon and, and the earth and all of these things, how could that God care for us? He does. He loves us. He's mindful of us. The text goes on to tell us that you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. And different translations will translate that differently. They'll say angels or maybe even God because it's this Hebrew word Elohim, which our translation that we just read from the ESV says, you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. That humanity has this higher place in the created order than the rest of creation, but lower than the heavenly beings. And he said, you've crowned them with glory and honor. And this text begins to, to, to instruct us that when we feel small, when we feel insignificant, remember these truths, that God is mindful of us, that God cares for us, and God's placed us in his creation with important work to do and important value. You know, Christians were, we, we talk sometimes in the, the news, the media will talk about human rights, that humans have value and worth. This is part of our you know, our, our founding documents as a nation that we have certain rights that we just have as humans, that concept does not come outside of the Christian worldview or, or a scientific worldview. If you're looking for that in science, like why, why do humans matter? Why, do, why should humans be treated with dignity and kindness? Why do they have any kind of rights? 
If you, if you start purely from a place of a scientific worldview, you're going to have a really difficult time coming up with good answers to that question. The, but the Christian worldview says that we are made in the image of God and as such have dignity and honor and value simply for being human, simply for being part of God's creation and simply being humanity, that we have human rights. And if you doubt that that's true, Go to some of the places in the world where Christianity has not had a large influence and see how people are treated there. Or study human history. Go back to the Mayans and the Aztecs and look at the human sacrifice that there were just thousands of people being sacrificed to honor their, their deities, right? That people were viewed as just utilitarian. Or look at, look at the Holocaust. Look at the communist revolution in Russia and the way people were treated during that time. That people were viewed more in a utilitarian way, that they have value because they contribute to the common good or whatever, but if they ever stop contributing to the common good, they have no value anymore, right? Christianity says every human is a part of God's creation, and we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, right? That's what our founding documents say, that we are a part of creation, but we are a privileged part of it. We play an important role we're not just, just like on the same level as baboons or chimpanzees. We, we have a, a role that we play that's really important, right? So humanity um, is not a parasite, by the way, which I, I, I've grown up, my entire life has been during the days of the environmental movement. We just studied the, or not just studied, but went to the museum where they were celebrating Expo 74, right? 50th anniversary of the World's Fair here in Spokane. And it was environmentally themed, and I was born a few years after 1974 um, in, in 1978. So my entire life has been shaped by this environmental worldview, which I, there's a lot of good um, that has come from that, that we need to care for our creation, that, that, that God has given us this creation as a responsibility and as a privilege, and we should steward it, right? That, that's an important concept for us. But there's some extreme worldviews as a part of that movement that say humanity is more like a parasite, like if all humans were gone off of the earth, the earth would be a better place. It'd be better off. We're just kind of taking away from the planet and we're, we're hurting the planet. And so human influence is essentially bad on the planet. And, and I, that, that's a worldview. That's a legitimate worldview that certain people have and that, that just conflicts big time with Psalms 8, right? No, humanity has a place of dignity and value in a part of our creation. We are, we are in dominion over the creation, and that's what David says in the psalm. You've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. People are of infinite worth and people are given this purpose that they have this place in God's created order to have authority and dominion over creation. And that's a privilege and a responsibility, right? That we have this authority over creation. And to paraphrase Uncle Ben from the Spider-Man movie, with great authority comes great responsibility, right? That we, you guys are in it. There's a weird vibe in this room this morning. Can we just point it out? You guys are all very serious this morning. It's okay. <laughs> With great responsibility, right, great authority comes great responsibility that we are given to creation to manage, right, to, to take dominion over creation. That does not mean to trash creation. In fact, it's the opposite of that, right? It's this idea of care and, and cultivation towards creation, and there's something deeply human about that. Whether you are taking dominion over your yard or over your bedroom to bring order out of chaos, you were doing something that's deeply human, given to you by God to take dominion over a creation and to care for it and to cultivate it. And as we do that, it actually gives us great purpose. And we all need that. We all need purpose in our lives. There's a, a story that Tim Keller shares in his book, Making Sense of God, um, by the physician, professor, and author Atul Gawande, he tells of a doctor who was working at a nursing home who persuaded its administrator to bring in dogs, cats, parakeets, a colony of rabbits, and even a group of laying hens to be cared for by the residents. And the results were significant. 
the residents began to wake up and come to life. People who, who they had believed weren't able to speak started speaking. People who had been completely withdrawn and non-ambulatory started coming to nurses' stations and saying, I'll take the dog for a walk. All the parakeets were adopted and named by the residents. The use and need for psychotropic drugs for agitation dropped significantly to 38% of the previous level, and deaths fell 15%. Why? The architect of these changes concluded, I believe that the difference in death rates can be traced to the fundamental human need for a reason to live. Gawande goes on to ask why simply existing, why being merely housed and fed and safe and alive seems empty and meaningless to us. What more is it that we need in order to feel that life is worthwhile? And the answer is that we, seek, we all seek a cause beyond ourselves. We see in this, this idea, this story of these people that are caring for part of God's creation and it gave them purpose in their lives that they didn't have before, where they felt like they were just being stored until the end of their lives. And, and taking this role and taking dominion over creation gave them great purpose. The most important thing I have to tell you this morning, though, is how this psalm points us towards Jesus. Because Psalm 8 has some very interesting things to, to teach us about Jesus and think, uh, areas to point us towards Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself quoted Psalm 8, and we'll get to that story in just a few moments. I want to reread Psalm 8, verse 2. Can we reread that together? Psalm 8, verse 2 says, Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. Now, if you're studying scripture and you get to like a verse you don't understand, if you're anything like me, you're kind of reading, you're like, oh, Lord's majestic, that's amazing, glory above the heavens, yes. And then you get to verse two and you just go, huh, not sure what that means. And then you keep reading, you know, looking for something else encouraging in there. I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers. Verse two is a weird one. It stands out to us like, what, what are you, babies and infants? What are you, what is the psalmist saying? You've established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. There's another translation in the NIV that says, through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. There's something going on in this verse in particular that is, is very interesting. That God takes the weak in this world and accomplishes great strength through it. And Jesus quotes this verse in Matthew chapter 21. So this is the story of Jesus and his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And he's coming in not as a conquering warrior, but coming in as a humble king riding on a donkey. And he's walking down the streets of Jerusalem or walking into the city of Jerusalem from Jericho. And there are people waving the palm branches and throwing their cloaks down on so that he has this royal entrance into Jerusalem. And they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then it says, Jesus goes from there. He enters Jerusalem. He enters the temple. And this is where we'll pick up, Matthew 21, 12 through 16. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? So he points to this passage. And he says that God has ordained or prepared these children to praise him. In the rest of the verse, he, does, he leaves off. But this idea of silencing the enemies that there's something powerful about God's people praising him, that it builds a fortress or a stronghold. Psalm 8 is, seeks, uh, the, there's other aspects of Psalm 8 that's pointed to by the New Testament writers. They'll, they'll say how Jesus fulfills this passage, that Hebrews 2 and 1 Corinthians 15, 
the, the writers point to this and they'll say, Jesus is the fullest fulfillment of Psalm 8. People made in the image of God, bringing glory to him, placing these things under Jesus' feet. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of what this passage is teaching us about. This psalm has encouraged us this morning to do, to do something specific that's really fundamental to the Christian life, which is to consider the bigness of God, the majesty and the glory of Jesus, the glory of the creator, and then to look at ourselves. And they go, based on who God is, based on his majesty, based on his glory, what does that mean for me? What do I do based on that information? And there's something about beholding his majesty and his glory and looking at him that sets our perspective about ourselves in the right way. That we are a small part of God's majestic and beautiful creation, but God is mindful of us. You think about that. God, God's, there is no place in creation where God is not. God is big. God is powerful. God is glorious. God is majestic. His glory and his majesty fills the earth and fills his creation. But God is mindful of us. You think about the significance of that word. His, his mind is full of you. If you ever feel small or alone or insignificant, God loves you. God, the God who created all of these things wants to be a part of your life. If he's not a part of your life, invite him in this morning. Invite him to become a part of your life today. Humans are of infinite worth to our creator God. And so that, that should affect, by the way, the way we treat ourselves and the way we treat the people that we interact with. That every person is made in the image of God and is, is crowned with glory and honor. And we should think of people in, in those terms and certainly think of ourselves in those terms as well. I want to just get us back to that idea for a moment again before we close of this idea of worship as warfare. That out of the mouths of babies and infants, God has ordained his praise or ordained his strength, depending on how you translate that passage. To silence the foes and the enemies. That the worship of God is powerful. That God showed us that there is great strength through weakness and humility, that the weakness of a baby or a child praising God will silence the enemies. That's a powerful thought for us to consider this morning, that there is great strength even through this weakness because God will work through that. And that's what God showed us on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, it was this moment that looked like weakness and loss, but through that was the most powerful reconciliation and act of redemption for all of humanity. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes with me for a moment, and, and before I pray, I want to read Psalm 8 over you. And as best you can, I want you to imagine that you're, you are beholding the glory of God and his creation in some way. Maybe you're looking at a star-filled sky, but consider the beauty and majesty of God's creation as I read Psalm 8 over you one more time this morning. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy in the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these truths. We thank you for what we've been pondering together this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to, when we look at creation, the next time we behold beauty, may we trace it back to you, the author and creator of all the good things in this world and the beauty that moves our hearts, that stirs our hearts. When we see a sky filled with stars, may it help us adore you and love you 
people, Lord, as we behold the bigness and the majesty of your creation, whether it's a mountain or the scale and scope of the universe, may we remember that your mind is full of us, that you love us, that we are very significant to you, that we matter, that you've given us infinite worth as people. And may that affect the way we interact with the people around us, that they are also people of infinite worth, crowned with glory and honor. Lord, you've also given us work to do. You've given us things that you're calling us to do, to to be in this place as a part of your creation, to take dominion over disordered things and, and chaos in this world. And Lord, ultimately that's on display through your son Jesus, that we have this message that reorders our lives, that brings peace to those who are in pain or those who are discouraged or those that are far from you. And so Lord, may we praise you May we extend that message far and wide. May that affect every single aspect and corner of our lives. As we behold your glory and your majesty, Lord, your word tells us that we are transformed from one degree of glory to the other. And Lord, as we lift up our voices in a few moments, may we see that act of worship as warfare. <laughs> that, that a statement against uh, the, the evil and darkness of this world, that, that your people worshiping you and praising you Though we may feel weak and insignificant, you will use this to accomplish good things in this world. So Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, would you stand? You open my eyes to your wonders anew. You capture my heart with this love. Nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. You open my eyes.